What's going on, everybody? I hope everyone had a great Memorial Day weekend. Took a second to reflect on, uh, you know, what the holiday is all about, but also to spend some time with friends and family. Uh, I had a great time. I went golfing, uh, hung out with the family, kind of just relaxed. My school year just ended, you know, as a teacher, the end of the school year, that last month is just brutal. And so having a little bit of time off is exactly what I need. I'm, I'm already working on home uh, house projects uh, in the yard this week. So, but nonetheless, um, we're on a Wednesday and Wednesdays are uh, terrific. The, the Q&As again are so much fun. You know, now, one of the things that is interesting about the Q&As when I do them is I, I am a person who likes to be asked questions. Like, I, I like it when people are curious about something, they want my opinion on something, and that's one of the reasons this is so much fun. You know, and what I have a tendency to do when I'm around friends or family or even new people that I don't know very well, is asking them lots of questions. Ask about their, you know, background and, you know, what their situation is. And, and just, it's just fun to, to ask questions, but it, I think it's also fun to be asked questions. And, and that's the fun part for me about these Monday and Wednesday videos, is that's what it is, is it's asking questions and giving my opinion on different topics. Um, now, one of the things that, uh, you know, I want to continue to remind everybody is these videos only happen if you ask questions. And this past week, I had a lot of great questions. I, in fact, I was having a really, really hard time trying to figure out which questions to ask. So I actually went with six. I know that every week I do five, but this week I said, I'm doing six. There was one or two that were kind of short, as you'll see here in a minute. And I just said, you know what? I just did my short-winded video over the weekend uh, with my buddy Scott from Ranger Studios. So I'm like, I just did a short one. So I'm just going, I'll go long this time. So I've got six questions for you this week from all of you. If you have a question that you want featured in an upcoming episode, please do not hesitate to ask it in uh, the, the comments down below. Now, you guys asked some really tough questions this week, and, and a couple of them you guys kind of pressed me on a topic that um, is a, a tough one. Uh, so I'm going to do my best here. Um, I'm going to do my best, and uh, but we'll, we'll see how this goes. But definitely some interesting and tough questions this week. Let's check out the first one here. Question for next week. You're at a garage sale and find a box of pre-war cards. There's some Hall of Fame cards in it. Your rough estimate is 10K of value for the box. There's a sign on it that says $1 a card. You go up to the older lady and say, where did you get the cards? She says, they were my husband's. He's no longer with us. You say, what do you want for the whole box? She says, uh, how about $50? You open your wallet and you have 150 in it. How do you proceed? How should others in the community proceed? All right. So, um, really tough question. So, my friend Theo uh, with his channel, Clemente Collector, is the one who asked that uh, question. He recently reached over a thousand subscribers. Congratulations to Theo. And I think that this question is a really, really difficult one for many different reasons. Um, so I'm going to just kind of walk through my thought process with this particular situation that he presents. First thing is, you know, when, when we're talking, and to me, this is almost a borderline morality question. Is this, uh, this is a question where it's like, what is the right thing to do? And whenever you're talking about a morality or what is the right thing or what is the wrong thing or is somebody being taken advantage of or is somebody getting, you know, what they're asking for, what, what's difficult about that is, is you're putting your morality or your moral um, beliefs onto what another person should be doing. So in this particular situation, the question is asked to me and what I would do. 
And that will be easier for me to answer than what I think others in the community should do. Because um, I don't know if just because I think something is the way to handle something, it doesn't mean it's what others should do um, if they're in the same situation. So I'll just kind of start with me. Now, you say that the box is a bunch of pre-war cards and uh, I estimate the cards to be worth $10,000 and the lady says she'll sell them to me for 50. So this is, uh, I try to dissect this. And again, this is all stream of consciousness. I don't have any notes. I don't have anything prepared. So I'm just going to kind of, you know, I'm sitting there hanging out with Theo and he asked me this question. This is just how I would respond, I suppose, because this is how I'm responding. My first time ever talking about this situation. Um, well, number one, we don't know a lot about the cards. Like, um, I think it's probably safe to assume that I could tell that they're likely not counterfeit um, just because I know enough about uh, these types of cards that there are some easy ways to determine uh, more or less if they're counterfeit. Now, is it possible I could get it wrong? It is possible I have some tools that I could use that would make it less likely that I would be wrong. I'm probably not carrying these around at a garage sale, uh, so I probably don't have these, but I think that I would probably be able to tell that they're authentic. Now, I wouldn't be certain that they were authentic until I got home and were able to check them a little bit more closely. So that is something that I think matters. The other thing is, is, you know, regardless of how nice they look, we don't know for sure if they've been altered unless we really get an opportunity to examine them, you know, measure them up, um, compare them to the size of other cards, uh, check some heavy magnification. The other thing is if they're just in a box, they probably weren't in any sort of screw down. Screw downs have, da they damage cards and that's going to actually kind of come up here in a little bit, but we don't know. We don't know for sure the authenticity. We don't know for sure if they've been altered. We don't know for sure if there's some sort of damage that we can't tell because maybe they were in a case at some point, which it sounds like they probably weren't. So all that being said, there is some doubt. There is not a certainty. If I knew for sure that these were worth $10,000, then I would probably proceed one way because I don't know for sure. And I'm just kind of assuming that I, I think I would uh, kind of go a different way. The other piece of this, and I'm going to answer it, but let me just kind of give you, I'm giving you my thought process. I'm giving you what I would be thinking about as I'm deciding how to, how to move forward in this. The other thing I would have to be considering is, you know, if I have knowledge that somebody else doesn't have, um, does that mean I should share uh, the benefits of that knowledge with someone else? Now, if the woman came to me and she said, hey, how much are these worth? And I said, oh, they're worth $50. But I knew that they were worth 10000 That's a much, much, much different situation. Again, in this case, she has an asking price and I'm, you know, probably going to pay the asking price. But if she came to me as somebody who's knowledgeable in this arena and I said, oh, you know, these, this box of cards, they're mostly junk. It's probably only worth 50 bucks. That is, that is a completely different situation than showing up at her sale and her saying, um, I'm asking $50. Now, all of that being said, I still haven't answered the question yet. <laughs> so let me kind of give you what I think that I would do. And again, it's really easy for me to get up here on a pedestal and answer this question, not actually being in the situation. You know, there are a lot of times that we have this sort of, you know, fictitious situation and it's like, how would you react? And we think we would react one way, but if push came to shove and that situation actually happened, we might actually answer it somewhat differently, right? So I think what I would do in this situation is I would pay her the $50 and I would say, hey, can I get your contact information? Because I think that there's a chance that these cards might be worth a lot more than what you're selling them to me for. 
And if it turns out that they're worth significantly more than this, I want to be able to contact you so that I can give you a little bit more money. You know, I, I like many people, watch the, the show American Pickers, right? It's got the two guys, uh, and they go around the country, and they kind of go through people's stuff, and they look for, you know, rusty gold, they call it. And there have been some times where they bought something from someone. They then got it appraised. They then found out it was worth way more, and they went back to the people, and they said, hey, I bought this because I kind of thought it was worth this or I didn't know for sure what it was worth. And I found out now that it's worth way more. So I want to give you more money. I see myself doing something more like that. I see myself getting her contact information saying, hey, I'm going to pay you the $50. There's a possibility these are worth a ton more. And if so, I'm going to come back and I'm going to, I'm going to give you additional money. Um, but if it turns out that they're not worth significantly more than you got the $50 that you're asking for. And, and she might decline and say, no, 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 it's okay. It's $50. Or she might say, oh, wow, that's really nice. Thank you. That's how I think I would proceed. Now, if I'm actually in the situation, it's, it's a little bit different because, you know, when you're actually in the situation. But from my perspective right now, I think that's how I would respond. Now, if the cards ended up being worth um, $1,000, to me, that's not um, like life-changing money for anybody. And that's not anything so significant that you, uh, I, I would feel this um, amount of like, I need to do something about it. That's not that big a deal, even if it was maybe up to uh, you know, a couple of thousand dollars. But if I found out that these cards were worth $10,000 or more, I think I would probably want to be able to get back in contact with the woman and, and, and share a little bit with her. Um, you know, Gary V, he's a, he's a motivational speaker. He's a businessman, an entrepreneur. He was into cards for a little bit. You know, he goes on, he does TikToks and YouTube uh, shorts and things all the time where he goes to different garage sales and he'll buy things. And, and I just watched a clip uh, within the last couple of days where he was talking about he bought a whole box of playbills. Those are the, the little um, programs that when you go to a, a Broadway show, they do the programs. And he bought this whole box of playbills and he's been selling. He bought the whole box for $20. And he sold about half the box so far and he said he's made five or $6,000. And he still has half the box left. And he didn't seem all that... Uh, interested, like he was going to try to go give them more money. And at the same time, he, uh, he, he, I didn't, I wasn't thinking that. Like when I was watching it, I wasn't thinking, oh man, he should have gone back and given them more money. Like that wasn't my thought process. Now, if it was a million dollars worth of stuff, then maybe that's a different story. But you know, when you acquire knowledge in a certain area, and you're willing to take some risk, you know, because if, if, if I'm risking $50, it sounds like this isn't a risk, but if I risk $50 and I end up finding out that they're all fakes, I can't go back and ask for my money back. So I'm taking all the risk, but then I'm not going to get all the benefits. So I think it really kind of just depends on how much money we're talking about. And again, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of different ifs in this situation, but if it ended up being worth 10,000 or more, and I only paid 50 bucks, I think I would want this person's contact information to kind of help them out a little bit more. Um, it also would depend, I, this might sound bad, and maybe it is bad, but if it seemed like this was a person who, where money was tight, um, I would be more willing to want to help them out. If it was, um, somebody in a really wealthy area and they were just trying to get rid of junk, um, I, I, I think I might be less inclined to want to share some of the, the profits with that person when they're probably way better off financially than me. So I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I think that's how I would respond. As far as how the community and what others should do, Again, I don't want to put my values and my moral beliefs on others, but I think that all I can do to answer the question is, is how I would handle it. 
If it's a thousand or two, eh. But if it's ten, twenty, fifty thousand dollars that I made off of this, then that would be a situation where I might try to seek out the lady and and share some of the proceeds. Question for the future. I purchased a 1956 Ernie Banks in amazing shape a long time ago. I thought it would grade a PSA 7 to 8. I got it back a while ago from PSA, and it came back authentic altered. The card has the natural rough edges, not trimmed and measures up, but not been colored. Appears to be free from any cleaning. Very, very slight wax stains on the back. Just no alterations from what I could see. I decided to crack it and send it to SGC. Of course, it came back authentic altered, with no other information. I cracked it out and took a close look at it. Sure enough, the four corners of the card were ever so slightly shiny and was likely compressed in a screw down in its previous lifetime. I find it annoying that the compressed corners would designate an authentic altered when cards with chopped off corners and sometimes get a one or a two. It got me thinking, would it be unethical for me to accidentally have dropped or sandpapered the card on all four corners to hide the compressed corners? I'm confident that roughing up the corners may give the card a chance at a two to four grade. I think I know your answer to this, and mine would be the same. It's unethical to do this just for a grade or opinion from a company. I could never get myself to intentionally damage a nice-looking card. I'm annoyed that grading companies find compressed corners as altered when cards with missing corners can receive a one grade. Just thought it was a strange instance where damaging a card could potentially increase the grade. All right. So another ethics question. And again, these are the... T- these are by far the toughest. Um, I am certainly not the morality police. I, I just have my opinions. And that's what you're asking is my opinion. Now, as far as why does the compressed corner, why do pr- compressed corners from um, old screw downs result in altered? Well, there are tools out there that people use to try to flatten out creases and flatten out bends and corners and and do things to cards that change their state or make it harder to see the appearance of a state that they were once in. And this brings us back to the whole altering, restoring cards thing. You know, is... Is that altering a card if you use a tool? I think using a tool is altering a card. That's just my opinion. Um, I think soaking cards is altering a card. I think if I have a card that I soaked, I should tell people before I sell it to them that it was soaked. We've been down this road. We've talked about altering cards before. And I totally understand this situation is... You know, altered for a lot of people, not everyone, but for a lot of people, a card that gets an altered um, grade, it's like a PSA zero or an SGC zero is the way that they look at it. Some people would pay more for an altered card than a two or a three because they want a card that just looks nice. So I, I guess part of the question is why are you getting the card graded? So if it comes back altered, but you like the card and you know that the card wasn't altered, you know that the card was just in a screw down. Why not leave it un- ungraded? Why not leave it uh, just raw in a, a card saver? Right? It, if you're going to sell the card and you want to grade it because you want to sell it, then, you know, then I kind of understand that that might be the reason to get it graded. But again, does that mean that you should alter it so it doesn't get an altered grade? Now, I mean, because th- that's what we're talking about, right? Let's think about this for a second. So you've got a card that's come back altered that really wasn't altered. It was just in a screw down. And by it being in a screw down, it makes it uh, appear to be altered. 
So using, as you just said, sandpaper on the card would be altering the card. So you want to alter the card so that the card doesn't get an altered grade. <laughs> I, I mean, now it's like the, it's like the Twilight Zone. It's like, it, I mean, I, I get it. I, I, I Trust me, I totally get what you're saying. What you're saying is the card was not, there were no shenanigans that happened with the card. The card was just in a screw down. So now it won't get a grade. But if the corner wasn't even there, if it was a super rounded corner, it would get maybe a two or maybe even a three. But because it was in a screw down and it looks compressed, because it is compressed, it can't get any grade. I totally get the situation. I don't think altering a card with a tool like that is something that I'm going to get on board with. Again, this is an ethics question, a morality question, and I'm not trying to put my value on somebody else's actions. But me, what would I do in your situation? I wouldn't use the sandpaper on the card, and I wouldn't rough up the, the, corner, the, the edges that it were compressed. Um, but there are things that people do to cards that compresses parts of the card that make the card um, altered. And screw downs do something similar, uh, even though the intention was not to deceive someone of the card's actual state. So in my opinion, I would either keep it raw or I would either sell it raw or I would grade it into the altered holder and sell it as an altered card but grade it, or, but sell it at a grade higher than what a normal altered card goes for and explain to someone the reason behind it. That's kind of my take, you know. Uh, last thing I'll say about this, I was at a card show with my dad. So my dad bought a card at a card show, um, I don't know, four or five months ago. Three, no, not even that long ago. Three months ago, two months ago. And the card had clearly been in like an album. You know those albums that have those little corner slots and you'd take old pictures and the pictures would kind of slip into those four corners and it would be in the album, right? Well, a card was put into one of those and it was a Willie Mays card, okay? It was a 1960 Topps Willie Mays. So my dad uh, bought the card and, and he could tell that it had this kind of... Um, it, it had sort of like what you're describing. It was sort of compressed on the corners and you could kind of see the design of those little corner things because it was kind of a little flatter there and it, it kind of left an impression. So my dad and I did a card show where we set up um, about a month ago now at a card show to sell some stuff and my dad had that card for sale. And there was a guy that was looking at the card and my dad said, hey, I just want to let you know that particular card, if you look at the corners, you can kind of see the impression. And, and he, he told the guy the situation. And the, the buyer said, wow, thanks so much for, for telling me that and pointing that out. I hadn't noticed. Um, I'll totally be a repeat buyer from you guys because I can tell that you guys are like totally being upfront and honest and not trying to deceive me. And the guy still bought the card. And... And he didn't pay the price as if there wasn't that indentation on there. He paid a price, uh, you know, somewhere between what an altered one would go for and what the grade would have been had it not had that um, alteration to it. So I think that's the way to handle it. That's the way that, you know, my dad handled it. And, and I totally am all uh, on board with, with those actions in this situation. Greg, the new Baseball Card Hall of Fame came out. Any surprises for you, and should the five-card limit stay or be expanded? Thanks. A commenter says, Greg, I hope you picked this question. I haven't asked you yet on your thoughts of the YouTube Sports Card Hall of Fame ballot results. Hashtag justice for Greenberg. All right. So you know how right after like the NCAA tournament bracket comes out 
or right after uh, an election or, or the Baseball Hall of Fame results come out. And the immediate thing is like the analysis. They go to a bunch of people. What do you think about this guy didn't make it? And, and this guy did make it. Or this team uh, got into the tournament and this team didn't. And, and these are the teams that kind of missed out and got, were snubbed. And, and a lot of the discussion is not about the surefire obvious choices. It's not about the one seed and the two seed. That's not the discussion at the uh, analysis of the release. The discussion is about the people who barely made it or the people who barely missed. The surprises, right? The kind of surprises, the tweeners. So, you know, Ray from Philly does the Baseball Card Hall of Fame. I did a whole video with him on it. Uh, I had a great time getting to know him. I've stayed in contact with him. He's an awesome guy. Absolutely awesome guy. And, you know, there were a few cards that sold in, I'm not sorry, there are a few cards that didn't get in that surprised me. And there are a couple of cards that got in that surprised me. And more than the ones that got in that surprised me, there were, it were the ones that didn't get in that surprised me. So I wanted to just talk briefly, because I've had a few people ask me about this. I wanted to talk briefly about four cards. Four cards that did not get in out of the 10 that were nominated and elected in. Uh, there were four that really kind of surprised me. So let's take a look at those four and let me share my thoughts on each of them here right now. So the first card was my number one ranked pick. The Walter Johnson 1909 Ramley. Now, I think it's a beautiful card. I think it's a beautiful set. It's a very expensive set. It's a very ornate set. A lot of people consider this Walter Johnson's rookie card. Now, when ESPN did their top 100 rankings, and, and I know ESPN is just ESPN. They're not the be-all and end-all. But most people would agree. Most people that are baseball people would say that Walter Johnson is the greatest pitcher of all time. ESPN ranked him the top pitcher and the number nine overall player. And this is his best card. This is his best card. If the best card from the best pitcher doesn't make the YouTube Sports Card Hall of Fame, I don't understand. So that, to me, was a, a one that I was surprised with. Now... When we look at the next one, the 1934 Gaudi set is a very important set, and the 33 Gaudi set is an important set. But when you think of the 34 Gaudi set, you kind of think of the Hank Greenberg rookie card. And it's sort of like the card. Now, I understand there are some Gehrigs in there. You know, there are some other good cards. But sort of like the key card from a rookie card perspective in the 34 Gaudi set is the Hank Greenberg. I mean, this was my second ranked pick. Again, I had ranked my 10 choices when I shared mine. And this came in 16th. Only 24.4% of people voted for the Hank Greenberg rookie card of the people who voted in the YouTube Sports Card Hall of Fame. That one bummed me out. Now, Tris Speaker, Tris Speaker, a lot of people would consider one of the top outfielders of all time, one of the top hitters of all time. Those same ESPN all-time player rankings have him as the 36th best player ever. This is his rookie card. The T206 is, you know, an iconic set. He's an iconic player. And it's his rookie card. This was my third ranked pick. And it got 21st in the voting. Only 21.3% of people that voted, voted for this card. I mean, this is one of the key cards in that set. Now, I realize it's not Ty Cobb. It's not Cy Young. It's not, you know, some of the other big names like Walter Johnson or Christy Mathewson in the set. But it's a really important card in the set. Now, the fourth one that bummed me out 
is the Tom Seaver rookie card. Now, I believe that the fact that the 67 and 68 Seaver are both on there kind of cannibalized some of the votes. Similar to how the Walter Johnson T206 and the Ramley both were up for uh, election. I think that's what happened. A lot of Tom Seaver people voted for the 68, and by voting for the 68 and not the 67, or the 67 and not the 68, neither one got in. You know, ESPN ranks him as the 22nd best player of all time, the 6th best pitcher of all time. And this one ended up in 13th place for the YouTube Sports Card Hall of Fame. So to me... Those are the four that I felt kind of were snubs that I feel like really should have gotten in but didn't. And, heck, maybe they'll get in next year. Greg, regarding Clemens in the Hall of Fame, do you dismiss the PED factor when rattling off his astounding numbers? Or do you figure, not unreasonably, that if he had not cheated, he would still have posted a Hall of Fame career. I suppose the same would apply to Bonds. He might never have broken Maris's or Aaron's home run records, but he was a great player even before he inflated his muscles and bat speed. I just don't know how much they should discount stats due to PED use. It's super interesting to me that you guys continue to twist the knife on me about Clemens. You know, I do not um, I do not skip questions. If there's a question that I don't use, it's not because I'm avoiding the question. If there's a question that you guys ask me that I don't use, it's just because I only do five, or in this week's case, six questions in, in a week. And so I'm, I'm never going to avoid anything. But the hate on Clemens and the hate on Bonds. Now, I understand. I understand that a lot of you... A lot of people, I mean, probably half, probably half of people hate Clemens and hate Bonds. And that's fine. I've never tried to convince anybody that they shouldn't hate Clemens or they shouldn't hate Bonds or they shouldn't have hate other people who took PEDs like David Ortiz. I don't do that. (laughs) I don't, I'm not going to try to convince you what you should or shouldn't like, who you should or shouldn't like, you know, but it seems like you guys really enjoy hearing me uh, try to talk about Clemens. Now, uh, I, I this is kind of a follow up from last week because I talked about it last week. And, you know, one of the things I said last week was, you know, when someone is accused of something in regular life if you're accused of some something you're innocent until proven guilty but in certain areas you're uh, guilty until you can prove yourself innocent um i also believe that when there's smoke there's probably fire you know if there are a lot of allegations and a lot of evidence points towards something it probably means that that thing happened you know The thing about Clemens is my love for Roger Clemens started when I was in third grade. As an eight-year-old, I started, I was obsessed with Roger Clemens as the, as the baseball player. I was, I was not obsessed with Roger Clemens as the human. I was on the little league team. That was the Red Sox. And I was a pitcher. And this is in you know, 1987, 1988. And the pitcher Roger Clemens was having incredible seasons at this time for the Red Sox. And I idolized him. Then I met the guy at a card show in San Francisco. And he could not have been kinder to me. He looked me in the eye. He shook my hand. He asked me if I wanted to come around the table so my dad could take a photo of us together. He could not have been kinder. And his intensity and his um, competitiveness was something that I completely related to. And I completely fell 
in love with rooting for Roger Clemens. And this is as a kid who grew up as a Yankee fan. And and with at this time, what happened with me is I became more of a fan of certain players than certain teams. I became a big Larry Bird fan because I, on the weekends, would wake up and watch NBA on NBC Basketball. And I would see Larry Bird on a lot because his teams were good and they were on a lot. And I loved Larry Bird. I had a little Larry Bird Boston Celtics jersey that I used to wear around. I was on the Red Sox. I was a pitcher. Roger Clemens was a pitcher on the Red Sox. I loved Roger Clemens. And for football, you know, I just happened to be a 49er fan. And I absolutely loved Joe Montana. I absolutely loved Jerry Rice. And I absolutely loved Roger Craig. And, you know, so <laughs> whatever transgressions happen in Roger Clemens' personal life, whatever happened with, you know, whether he did or didn't take different substances, does not, affect, does not, does not change the fact that I idolized him as a kid. I went and saw him pitch multiple times whenever he was in Oakland, which some years was only one time, a three-game series. He may not have even pitched. I saw him pitch like 85% of the time that he pitched from about 1988 to 2005 or whenever. I, I saw him pitch almost every time I, saw, I went to the games, which was, you know, an hour and a half away. So having me continue to have to defend him, who this guy, I'm just not a person. I am a very loyal friend, family member, colleague, that when somebody does something, doesn't do something, is accused of something, has an accusation of something, I don't just turn my back on people. That's just not how I work. So... My childhood is not ruined forever and stained forever because Roger Clemens had a, a trainer who, who says that he provided Roger Clemens with HGH. It's just, as much as people try to have me hate him, I'm just not going to hate him. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what to say. Now, to the question in general, the question in general, is about how much their stats should be affected because of uh, allegations or proven use by different players. I've, I've been very consistent in my opinion on this. And my opinion is, if you're somebody who is a Hall of Famer, before any uh, allegations, suspe suspicions, um, you know, took place, it shouldn't erase you from uh, your past uh, accomplishments, right? If, if I was a, uh, a golfer who broke par um, 20 times in my, in my life, and then I go out golfing in a week, and I'm playing with somebody, and I miss keep score. I put down a par when I had a double. It doesn't mean that suddenly all those other times that I was a good player and broke par don't count. Those rounds aren't erased. I still had some great rounds. And I did something that I shouldn't have done later on. So it doesn't mean that I was never a good golfer just because I did something I shouldn't have done a week from now. It, those rounds still happen. My ability still occurred. Doesn't mean that I'm now a bad golfer forever. That's, that's my take on it. So Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer before he took anything. I think that Roger Clements was a Hall of Famer before anything went into his body. I think that Sammy Sosa wasn't a Hall of Famer before he took stuff. So to me, Sammy Sosa doesn't belong, but Barry Bonds does. Now, some people say, no, you know, 
sorry, but it's the scarlet letter. It, once you're attached to it, 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 everything prior, everything is tainted from the beginning of your career to the end of your career, because at the end of your career, you participated in something that you shouldn't. And I'm, I've never tried to tell anybody that that opinion is wrong. That's just not my opinion. I don't think that all of the Cy Youngs that Clemens won, all of the strikeouts, all of the wins, all of the playoff appearances, all of the 20K, you know, games, I don't think that those get erased because this guy says that he delivered and injected Clemens towards the end of his career. That's my opinion. And if someone else has a different opinion, great. <laughs> And that's totally okay. And, but that's my opinion. So to me, it's what was your career before the allegations? And what were your, what was your career after the allegations? If you suddenly were an amazing player like Brady Anderson and Luis Gonzalez? Or Sammy Sosa? Or if you were a Hall of Fame caliber player before anything was ever alleged. That's just my opinion. Doesn't make it right, and you might think it makes it wrong, and that's okay. Question. Your friend Mookie sends you an Ernie Banks rookie card with a pinhole. Do you pin it on your Hall of Fame board or grade it? Well, first of all, I think this is a great idea. Mookie, I think you should buy me and 54 tops, Ernie Banks with a pinhole. I think that's a fantastic idea. I can't wait to receive it in the mail. Um, would it go on the, the uh, pinhole uh, Holy Grail Wall of Fame? Um, I would say it depends. It depends. See, I get cards graded um, mostly because... A, I want to authentic authenticate them. B, I want to protect them. And C, because if I were to sell the card, then I would want the card to be more liquid and get the maximum value from it. And having it graded allows for more transactions, like electronically, and allows you to get more out of the card. So my answer to this would be, if this was a really, really nice card with a pinhole. I probably wouldn't put it on the cork board with the other pinhole cards that I've received from Mr. Chilson because it would it, I would want to protect it and I would want to um, get it authenticated. Now if he gave me a card I'm not selling it. I'm not I don't sell gifts. So any card that anybody's given me I'm not selling. Uh, so I wouldn't sell it, but I would want to protect it. Um, and if it was in really good condition, it would be worth protecting. Now, if the card was really, really beat up, really rounded corners, creases, and had a pinhole, then yeah, I would probably, I would probably put it up on the, the Holy Grail pinhole wall of fame because... Um, I don't need to protect it because there's nothing more that could be done to it that would harm it if it was just thrashed. Um, and since I'm not selling it, it doesn't really need to be authenticated. And because I'm not selling it, it doesn't really need a grade so that I can, uh, you know, liquidate it. So, so because it's a gift, I think the answer is, if it was a high-end pinhole card, I would probably get it graded and store it with my other graded cards. If it was uh, a really beat-up version, I think uh, I would put it up with the others because there's not really a need to protect it so much. I have a question for future consideration. I'm not sure if you've ever considered this question. My question is, have you ever considered or did you ever crack a slab you ever considered undergraded? 
I ask this because recently I was bidding on eBay for a Kofax rookie card that was graded an SGC1 poor. I look this card over and over as best you can on eBay, and for the world of me, I was way undergraded in my opinion. My thinking was to get this card, which is a grail card of mine, and resubmit it. Well, everyone who looked at this card must have seen what I saw because I lost out on it. I bid up to $640 and lost out, I believe it sold for about 650 Would you have paid way more than comps and go for a card that certainly seems undergraded? Another question says, if you buy a card that's graded, you think has been significantly undergraded, can't you always crack it out and get it graded again? All right, so there's several questions in here, several points in here that I want to talk about here. Um, first, would I ever pay way above comps over a grade? Yes, I do that. I have done that. Um, I think that a card that is centered is generally more appealing to me and others than a card that is severely uncentered, off-centered. And so because of that, if there's a centered copy of a card, I will pay more than a off-centered copy, um, especially the older the card that we're talking about. When quality control was really bad, way back in pre-war especially, I don't think that uh, there are nearly as many centered cards as off-centered cards. So if there's a card that's a two that looks pretty nice and it's centered, I will absolutely pay premium um, over the comps because I think that the rarity of the centering makes it more desirable and makes it more valuable than a two that is significantly off center. Now, as far as cracking slabs and, and all of that, I guess my question is, well, have I ever done it? Let's start there. I personally have never taken a card that I thought was undergraded and cracked it to resubmit it to get a new grade. I have personally not done that. I know a lot of people have. And I don't really think there's anything wrong with that. Because again, as I've said many times, a grade is just one person's opinion with another person's confirmation on a given day. It's, it is an opinion. It is not the law. It is not the final answer to how nice the card is. It's one person's perspective of that particular card that day. So I don't think that it's like bad to crack a card and resubmit it. I've not done it. Now, have I ever cracked a card and resubmitted it? Yes, I have. Uh, why did I do that? So I had a 1958 Topps um, Willie Mays. And the 1958 Topps Willie Mays was pretty rounded. Um, it was pretty clear to me it wasn't trimmed. Um, but it just had heavy wear on it. And it was in a PSA 2 holder. And it was an old PSA 2 holder, like a second or third generation PSA 2 holder. And it, uh, the, the holder was so old that it was pretty scuffed up. And so I liked the card, but I felt like the card um, didn't look that nice in the old scuffed up holder. So to get the card reholdered, it's like, I don't know, 15 or $20 with PSA. So what I could have done and, and what I was planning on doing is I was planning on sending that card to PSA, waiting two months or whatever for them to reholder it, paying my $20 or whatever they charge, and then getting it back. But then the more I looked at the card, it actually had pretty decent eye appeal. So I said, I think that this could do better at SGC because SGC tends to grade more on eye appeal than on the sharpness of a card. PSA seems to care more about how sharp a card is. And SGC, in my opinion, seems to care more about the eye appeal of the card. And that's their grading, I think, is more impacted by those things. So I'm like, it actually is a pretty decent eye appeal card. Um, I think... I am going to, uh, th my perspective was, I think I'm just going to crack it. Instead of waiting two months for PSA and paying 20 bucks, I'm going to send it to SGC for 15 bucks. 
and I'm gonna have it back in a week and a half. <laughs> Basically, I'm getting it reholdered, and I'm getting a different opinion. I did that, and the card came back an SGC 2.5. So it went from an SGC or a PSA 2 in an old holder to an SGC 2.5. So I have done that, but I didn't send it in just to be regraded. I sent it in to be reholdered, and along the way, they were going to grade it, and I thought it might do better. Um, as far as cracking cards, I think that people need to be really, really careful about this. I think that people tend to just go, oh, I'm going to crack. I'm going to buy that card. It looks nice. I'm going to crack and resubmit it. We have to understand that when they started grading cards at like PSA and SGC in the uh, late 90s, mid to late 90s, they don't use the same technology that they use now, okay? They have technology now that measures the card electronically, like through a computer system that they didn't have then. They used to use like rulers to measure the card. So if you crack a card that was originally slabbed, you know, 30 years ago, if you do that, there is a decent chance that the new technology is going to find something that the old technology didn't find. You know, if you go to SGC's, you know, I've seen videos on SGC and, and they do like an infrared scan of cards and you can kind of see wrinkles that are almost impossible to see with the naked eye. They didn't do that 30 years ago. So as they're grading the card and they give it the infrared scan, they might see things that they didn't see before. So I think that P by saying I'll just crack it and resubmit it, what people are doing is they're disregarding the risk of doing that. There might be something that gets caught this time that wasn't caught last time because the process is not the same. It has changed. And because it has changed, it probably makes them more consistent. And it probably catches some things that happen. But it also might catch things that they didn't catch before. So if you have a card that you think should be changed, the grade should be changed, I don't recommend cracking it and resubmitting it. I recommend if you really feel strongly that it was a mistake, is sending it in for a review. Having it reviewed potentially bumped and say, oh, that'll never happen. I've seen it happen because my dad has done that. My dad had his Joe Montana rookie card get bumped from a nine, a PSA nine. He sent it in for review and it got a 10. So it absolutely happens. They absolutely will upgrade grades of cards and holders. You don't have to just crack it out. So I don't recommend cracking out a card, especially a card that was graded ages ago. Now, if you just got the card back a week ago and you think it was misgraded, then maybe crack it and send it back in because it's going to go through the same technologies and they didn't think it was, they didn't think it was trimmed this time, last time. So they probably won't next time. But if you're looking at a card that's a second or third or fourth generation PSA slab or an old SGC slab, and you think that it deserves a better grade, I think you should be really, really careful and really think twice before you crack out the card and send it back in. Because I think there's a good chance that they might find things that they didn't find before. That's my opinion. So... I don't think it's as simple as just saying, ah, oh, just crack it and resubmit it. I think it's a bigger risk than sometimes people realize. That is my answer to my sixth question. I did six this week. Now, again, I, genuinely, it is a huge compliment to me when you all reach out and say, this is a question I have for Greg. I'm going to take the time to go in, leave a comment with the question that I'm interested in his opinion on. That is a major compliment to me, that you're gonna take the time to ask me a question and you actually care what I think about it. So if you have a question, as always, 
please don't hesitate. Please don't hesitate to ask it. Again, all you have to do is down below in the comments, you don't even have to say, here's my question. Just simply type out your question and I would be honored to give you my opinion on it. And again, that's all it is. It's just an opinion. Some of the things that I talked about today, you might totally disagree with me and that's okay. If we agreed on everything, would that really even be fun? The fun thing is that there are things we agree on and there are things we disagree on. And I totally respect all sorts of differing opinions on these topics. That's just kind of where I'm coming from. And that's the basis for the opinions that I come up with. And I encourage you, if you've not asked a question before, take a second this week and down below in the comments, ask your question.